So off the back of a, another disappointing defeat for Liverpool at the weekend, and um, I felt like I needed to, to to clear the air and speak. So I'm having I, I could literally just say the same thing every podcast at the moment because we're that bad. But um, I thought I would have a, a chat with someone, um, and we'll cover football, but we'll also cover. Um, what he does for a living and joining me I've got some build up here for you by the way oh yeah master PGA professional oh yeah one of the youngest to ever achieve the status yeah yeah 10 yeah. major winners 43 tour wins and a member of three Ryder Cup winning squads obviously on the coaching side ladies and gentlemen it gives me great pleasure to uh <laughs> no. joining me this morning is Phil Kenyon. Phil, how are you doing? Yeah, good, Gav. Yeah, good, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, very good. Just uh, just in case people I mean, there'll be a lot of people watching this who, who are into yeah. it, but just give us a little breakdown of what you know what it is you, you're doing. Um well I'm a golf coach, as you know. Um <clears throat> been a um a PJ pro for a number of years now. So like last 20 years of my life has been involved around coaching in golf and specifically um, as a putting coach. So putting is a very sort of specialist part of the game and uh, somehow kind of stumbled into um, that as a career. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to work at a fairly high level within the game. So with a lot of like elite players, so a lot of my time spent traveling working with those players at different events, um, following like the PGA Tour or European Tour. And as you mentioned then, fortunate enough to, you know, a few of the players that I work with have played a number of Ryder Cups. And so, uh, yeah, been to a few Ryder Cups, which have been great spectacles. Closest to a football match, I'd say, golf-wise. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's, that's what I've been doing. Well, you're a big Liverpool fan. And we, we've been we've been mates for for years, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um. So we'll we'll start with the football, and we'll get to golf in a bit. Um. So Liverpool at the moment, current form. Um. Obviously, they've just given us the best three years that we've had for a long time. Um. I think last season in particular, you know, winning games. Every, you know, just just a machine. <laughs> Just rolling, and you 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 had utter belief in them. That was that's the thing that I'm finding struggling to to deal with is that I had that utter belief where I'd be like, these boys will be all right. They'll deal with that, whatever you know, whatever it is, they'll deal with that. Um, how you know, what are your feelings at the moment at, during this season and, and where we are and where we've been? I, I'm struggling to comprehend it actually. Um, I know. You know, I think like what last season when we came back, there was a few cracks appearing, wasn't it? Just at the, the beginning of the pandemic, you know, like the Watford game, mm. um, you know, Madrid game, and then obviously went into lockdown. And when we came back, I don't think the form was particularly great, but we did what we we did to get over the line and everything. But then that like this this year, I, <clears throat> I'm fairly pessimistic when it comes to football. But I remember looking at the fixtures just prior to Christmas and thinking Christmas list here, like we could, we could be 10 points clear, you know, after Christmas, we put a bit of a, you know, good run of a, uh, good run of fixtures, play well, could be 10 yeah. points clear. And literally since then it's been terrible and I can't get my head around how bad that we've actually been. Mm. Like you said, you've had like this utmost faith that whatever these players as a group, that they're faced with just, you know different challenges. They'll they can come back and respond. But yeah, it's just not been there, isn't it? And and um, I, I can't put my finger on it. Obviously, I'm not an expert in football, so I, I don't expect to. But it's just been it's just been a struggle to comprehend um, the results and the sequence of events that that have gone in after, like you said, three years of impeccable football and. And brilliant results, you know. I mean, to lose six games at home against sides that you would question whether we should be losing to. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been it's disappointing to say the least, isn't it? Watching the games, it's we're seeing the same thing over again. Over again, yeah. we you, you you can almost it's. I mean, I've said this before, but I'll, I might as well say it again. It's like watching a film that you've already watched and you know the ending. It is yeah. the same thing, and especially that 
the inability to get one up always leaves you vulnerable. You, it's nil-nil, and you know if they nick one. And they're defending in a block anyway. They're defending at the, on the edge of the box for their lives. I mean, I'm, I'm not bemoaning people playing well, but Christ, some, some of the defensive performances I've seen over the last few weeks have been astounding, goalkeeper performances. And, and that's what they're there yeah. for. It's fine. But we just, we've just lost... Um, an ability to be creative. It seems like the imagination's gone out of us. Totally, yeah. Yeah, because I, I don't think like all of a sudden the rest of the Premier League have notched up a level and, and you know, it's, it's our level dropped, hasn't it? Mm. The disappointing thing for me was watching that Chelsea game where I felt like Chelsea outpressed us. Mm. You know, I felt like they outworked us, outpressed us, looked sharper. Everything that we would normally be last year, they, they looked. And I, never, I thought, we're never going to win this game. Mm. Um, and that was that was concerning for me because I thought the Everton game I thought like you know I thought you know a few, a few games before that rubber the greens not going our way a little bit but I just thought I think our performances now are really deteriorating and I think that obviously comes from a lack of confidence yeah I think like the the number of changes he made at the weekend I, I, I'd question that um, I don't know what his reasons for Um but yeah, I mean, we could go into uh, a discussion about why you're playing badly, or you know, and question some of the things that are going on. But certainly, yeah, the performances haven't been great, haven't they? And they deteriorated. And like you said, you kind of almost knew what was coming mm. on 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 Sunday. The longer that game went on, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, we 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 need to respond, don't we? I saw an article by Phil Thompson the other day, and you know, he and he he said it's a crisis at Liverpool, and. Mm. He wasn't questioning Jurgen like as to whether he was the right man or not, because clearly he's the right man and anyone who, who puts it forward that you still he's not that, yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Um but I mean who who would come in and replace him and do a better job with that group of players? I mean, you know, his record and what he's done for Liverpool, um, he's got plenty of time left at that club for me. Um but he needs to do something, doesn't he? You know, we need to snap out of it. We need to finish this season strong. And, um, yeah, you know, we need to be playing Champions League football, don't we? Yeah. You know, so uh, whether we win the Champions League, which would be a tall order, or whether we can put a really good run together and, and get in that top four, which I think is highly unlikely, but we need to be playing Champions League football because I think we need to recruit um, you know, I think the, the club needs to, you know, that net spend needs to get higher. They've got to put some money in and we need to recruit and play in Champions, Champions League football is obviously going to help us bring the calibre of players that, you know, we need. So, yeah, um, we, we need to up our game, don't we? It's an interesting point that we need to recruit and I'm sure there's there's certain people who... who who, who would agree with you. It's not something I've thought of. And I think probably because when I look at our squad, let's say if you look through the, the standard first 11, there's none of them that I would want replacing. So no, but I don't think say, we have a good, good enough squad though, Gav. And clearly... So you're talking about depth? Yeah, I'm talking about depth and then someone that's going to come on and, and change the game or someone that's going to really put pressure on a position. And really, I don't think we have that enough of that. And I think this year, with the injuries that we've had, um, I think that's kind of shown up a little bit because you know, obviously, defensive injuries we've had. The managers end up playing two uh, central midfielders in there yep. because he hasn't got enough confidence in you know the the um, the squad, the, the the other defenders in the squad. You know, and what you know, if Trent gets injured, who's going to be playing at right back there? Well, um, it's Milner or, or Nico Williams, who's, who's only a kid himself, isn't it? Yeah. So, and, and Milner's, you know, how long has Milner got left? And I think up front as well, like obviously Mane's lost confidence and form. Um, I think we got we we're unlucky, obviously with Jota getting injured, but you know we've we no no real replacements to come in, and 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 I think the Fulham game showed that, didn't it? You know, mm-hmm. like made seven changes. And I'm looking at that team and thinking, well, I don't, you know, I don't think the players are, that are good enough. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the Jota thing. I, I mean, I had I had this chat with someone the other day, and uh, 
he was bemoaning the lack of spending. But and I, and I pointed out that in the summer, I mean, I think this is the strongest Liverpool squad we've had for a long time. Um, and in the summer, we went and strengthened from a position of strength. We went and signed Jota, forty odd million. We went and signed a world class midfielder in. Tiago, and we signed a left back. We've all been asking for a backup left back, and he hasn't played at all. And Robertson's just played, so I don't know whether he was the wrong signing or he's just been unlucky. So, I mean, the money they did actually invest in the summer. I mean, I genuinely believe that there was a choice, and I'm guessing Jurgen and the team took it. You can either have Tiago, you can have a centre back. Which are you going for? And he went for Tiago. And I think in the summer, every Liverpool fan probably probably would have agreed with that choice if it was a flat choice. I think the question is to FSG, why was it a choice? Why wasn't it Thiago and a centre-back? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would, I would agree with you. I think we definitely needed a centre-back. And why? You know, because I don't think, how much did we spend on Thiago? 20, 20 million? 20 odd million. And it was, I mean, this is all seen through the, the, prism of of a pandemic no fans in the stadium less revenue yeah we did we you know we we've done our, our our deals in the summer haven't we to get good players and michael edwards has worked his magic to get the deals to suit the pandemic basically but which is great and he, well, and he Klopp's took, top clops took a, um, a gamble in the summer let's be honest He's, he's gone into the, into the season with three centre-backs and Fabinho. Now, really, which yeah. Fabinho should be a fifth centre-back. He shouldn't be the fourth. And he made yeah. that gamble. And it's the same gamble that Pep Guardiola took last year. He went in with three centre-backs and Fernandinho. And they had they only really lost Laporte, who's their best um, centre, centre-back. They lost Laporte. Yeah. And look where, what happened to them. They... You know, they. I think they lost nine times last season. We've lost all three centre backs. I mean, that's unprecedented. If you take three centre backs, the three senior centre backs out of any team in our league, and you will see where they end up. And that's exactly where we ended up. Yeah, yeah. No, I get, I get that. I think we've been particularly unfortunate in in, in that respect. Um, but you know, my my concern is, and I, I think we'll. This conversation, from my point of view, is if if those if your four if your fourth and fifth centre back aren't good enough, what what what's the point of having them? Like so, and he's playing he's playing Fabinho and Henderson primarily are his first choice centre backs, and to me they're they're our best two midfielders. Yeah. So if you're going to look at like what's gone wrong this season, obviously front three aren't playing very well. We've got a totally different midfield and no defence. Mm. Um, you know, in compare and our, and our midfield last year, I thought was brilliant. Hen- primarily Henderson, Fabinho, Wijnaldum. You know, aggressive, strong. Yeah. You know, move the ball forward quickly. Henderson for me, under massively underrated. And you take two of those and you put them in defence. It's like you, you've got no midfield. Mm-hmm. And Thiago comes in, obviously a great player, but what a situation to come in. Yeah. Um. So it's like. You, you at a club that that fourth and fifth centre back need to need to play. They, they they need to be good enough to then you you know you can play your first choice midfield and and that's the thing where uh, that disappoints me is that either if Klopp doesn't think they're good enough those those two you know the fourth and fifth centre back then why are they at the club? Might as well just have three. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, so. I, I don't think he anticipated. I mean, Nat Phillips nearly left in the summer. I don't think he anticipated. You can't you can't plan for three centre backs being out for the season? No, you know, let's be honest. No. You can't. You really can't plan for that. And he, Nat Phillips, was was on his way out. You know, Reese Williams had, had been on loan. I don't think he anticipated they were going to play. I think he anticipated that maybe Matic would be injured and and he'd be able to make do with Fabinho. But it's it's all with hindsight, isn't it? And it's it, you can't really. You you can't really call him for, for for sat here now for a decision that he made at the time when Van no, Dijk, Gomez, no. and Matip are all fit. No, I guess it's probably my lack of understanding of football and how it works, but I can't get my head around. You've got you know players that aren't good enough to be in the first team, the team, but yet they're in the squad. Mm. Um, you either put your your, your trust in them, um, but yeah. But I do think we need a, a, a better squad. We need some better options. I don't think our squad is as good as 
um, cities. And if you know, if we want to win multiple leagues, you know, compete at that level, I do think we need a stronger squad, a stronger bench. So you know, competition for places. I think our first eleven, it's phenomenal, isn't it? When they're playing well, they got confidence, but that clearly they've lost their confidence at the moment. They've lost that spark. And if you've got someone who's at that level, but on the bench, well, they're coming on with something to prove, aren't they? They're seeing it as an opportunity to grab a place. And I feel like we, we, we need that. don't think we have enough competition for those front three places. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously we've not, you know, the, the, the uh, defensive thing, not enough competition there. I, w- I was generally happy with our midfield options. Like, I mean, Thiago to me was almost like a, a luxury back purchase. Yeah. Um, and it was like, oh, okay, a world class player coming in. We've never necessarily bought like a player at that level. Let's see where it fits in. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I personally would have spent elsewhere, but I wasn't going to be cry someone a player of that calibre coming in. I'd not re- actually watched much of him, and then you, you hear a few rumours, and then you, you end up watching a few games. You watch the European Cup final because he's in it. Yeah. And obviously had a great game, didn't he? So you're rubbing your hands thinking, what can this player add? And I feel a bit sorry for him because he's come in to a completely different scene that we had last year in yeah. terms of the way we're playing and the dynamic of everything. So well, we I'm sure see, you... We got to see that, what, how it was planned to be in one game, really, didn't we? Which was the Everton game. Until Van Dijk went off, that was the team. You know, you, I think we yeah. had Fabinho... Thiago and Henderson in midfield, was it, or would it be in Wijnaldum? Either way, it was the team that he had planned at the beginning of the season. And yeah. I've got to say, when we played Everton at Goodison, we looked, we looked great. We really did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, we I thought we looked pretty good at the start of the season, first half of the season, weren't we? I mean, because it's always like, it's like that second album, isn't it? you know, you win the league after, and then it's going always going to be a little bit tricky. And, and I, I didn't expect them to perform to the level. I knew that there'd be some element of drop off. I guess just as, you know, a fan's perspective, it's just been alarming, hasn't it? In the last, the last couple of months, what's happened. But I think there's lots, it's such a weird year, isn't it? Post or pandemic and beyond. It's Mm. it's weird. Like no fans in the stadiums, the results that you've seen, there's obviously a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I also think it shows how much, you know, the impact fans have, I think for us as well, because you know what the Anfield crowd is like, Gav. You know, a couple of bad results, they're not necessarily on the back, are they? They You come out, that Fulham game, the, you know, they, they would carry that group of players over the line, wouldn't they? Because the, the fans, they're not having another loss. And and I think Anfield, like, it definitely, without fans, it's had an impact. No doubt about it. Can't argue with that. Um but why hasn't it had an impact on Man City? Well, they don't have any fans in the first <laughs> place, do they? <laughs> oh, it's not the same atmosphere, is it? I mean, they play in an empty stadium every week. So, um, uh, for me, I, I, I think there's a culmination of factors. You've got injuries, obviously loss of confidence, that natural, like, um, for, you know, that you know, following up of, um, that, that first album scenario. And then obviously, you know, you know, it, the injuries have played a big part, but I, I do think we miss the fans definitely at, at home. From your expertise in your field, if you had a, 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 a player who was having a crisis of confidence with putting, how would you begin to repair that? Well, I think... I know, like, I mean, golf's a very different sport, isn't it? It's an individual sport and you've got a team game. So there's a different dynamic. And I know, like, in golf, it's really hard to perform at a high level for a sustained period of time. There's so many variables at at play that you get, you know, fluctuations in performances. And there's very few players that have performed at the highest level for a long, long period of time. There's probably only a couple in history. Um, you know, Tiger Woods being the most recent one. But I've worked with some players who have, you know, hit like a world number one or a top five status and had a prolonged period of success. But just naturally, there's so many variables which can impact the player's performance. It's difficult to sustain that. But when you do have 
you know, drop-offs, you need to analyse your performance, what's going wrong. So, you know, where is it from a golfing perspective where you might be losing shots relative to the field? Is it in your put in? Is it in certain types of puts? You know, driving short game. So you analyse the game component of it and then you, you know, you bring that down to like the technical elements which could be influencing that. And a lot of times it's coming back to basics and then addressing those basics and making sure you're doing those basics really well in training and in practice and then going out and trying to foster confidence, you know, go and do those, those things that you could do really well in, in practice. You go out and you perform and ultimately it's down to the player to perform. You know, that's the, the psychology of performance, the intrinsic motivation, commitment, focus that they have when they go out onto the golf course or the pitch. But in training, you've got to make sure that you're ticking all those boxes and addressing any of the, the issues technically that might be letting the player down. So from a football perspective, it, I guess, you know, you know, any football coach, you're trying to address the patterns of play or the, you know, the whatever it is that the they focus on is making you do making sure you're doing those as you want to. I mean, that's like the Chelsea game for me, the pressing, like, why why aren't we pressing like we used to press? That would be one thing. Why aren't we doing that? Because I thought Liverpool would outwork any team. You know, previous years, not only will, would we have quality in like particularly that front three, but we'd also work harder, we'd press. Yeah. And I feel like that's dropped off. So why is that dropping off? I mean, you've got all your different pro zone stats, stuff like that. As a coach, I'd be looking at, you know, are we running as much? You know, what are our, what's our possession like? What are we... <clears throat> You know, in terms of when we're not got the ball, what what we're doing, you'd analyse those a- aspects, and I'm sure they're doing that. I have no clue about football, by the way, technically or tactically or technically. But as a coach, you're looking at the, you know, the those analytics, making sure you're doing what you you need to be doing. A lot of time, you're going back to basics, making sure you do that in practice, and ultimately, then it's down to the player to go out and and and, and perform make the right decisions at the right time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, like in football, obviously, although it's a team game, you've got that individual element, and you know there's a weird psychology in football, isn't there? Where sometimes the team can be greater than the sum of its components, and yeah, and you know there's like a, a momentum that can be generated by that that interaction of those individuals. But at the same time, you've got the opposite that of that, haven't you? Where you get a few guys who personally lose their confidence, which clearly I think has happened now. And it could be like a snowball effect. And the and, machine breaks down then, doesn't it? And I think, yeah, we've definitely got a sum less of its parts at the moment. Completely, yeah. Um, but that's down to the coaching staff now, isn't it? To, to, to do things, to make sure that each player knows what they need to do, have confidence in, 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 in what they're doing and go out and do it. Mm. And, uh, you know, results obviously help us, the psychology, don't they? And we, we yeah. need results now. But I think, like, if if you've ever got a man manager, like, you know, you'd say, like, Klopp. Yeah. That, if you look at Klopp and Pep, who are two probably, you know, widely regarded as the best managers out there, to me, they have, like, they ha- they look like they have great man management skills. Like, Pep, to me, looks like he's a great man manager. You know, I watched that Amazon documentary with interest, and you can see his personality. And, and I've met him, actually. Um, he's a Bang. he's a good friend. Eh? Bang! It, it, so I just dropped something. Ugh, put that back. Um, he's a he's a big golf nut. Is he? And he's a he's a good mate <laughs> of uh, a player that I work with, Tommy Fleetwood. So he played um, in the Irish Open a few years ago, pro am, and I, I met and chatted with him a little bit. There, nice guy, but he's got a personality, got interpersonal skills, and Klopp, you know, has that. So and. That, you know, so for me, Klopp's the right man because pe- those players need an arm around them, don't they, as much as anything at the moment, but they also need a game plan as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So we've, we've, we've segued quite cleverly into golf because you know, did you notice what I did there? Did you see that? I didn't. It was seamless. A bit, <laughs> a bit, like, you're, a bit like you're mixing. <laughs> so uh, let's have a chat about golf. Um, yeah. How, how did you put in? How did you, become, like you said at the beginning, it's a very specialised area of golf. How did you yeah. become, go from being a, a tour pro yourself to being in 
to putting and then to becoming a master PGA professional at putting and being the putting guru in the world of golf? Um, well, obviously, we played golf together as kids, didn't we? So you, you knew or you know a little bit about my background and I was obviously loved my golf as a kid, played decent amateur level stuff. I went to uni and I studied like sports science at uni. And I always enjoyed that side of things. I'm quite like analytical and, and I went to uni because I need, I thought I need a degree here, but I thought, well, I'd rather go and do something that's related to sport because in the back of my mind, I wanted to play golf. So I went and did sports science at uni, finished uni and, and turned pro to play. And um, I played like full time for like five years, at, you know, mini tour level and didn't really do any good. Knew at the end of that five years, I needed to move on like with my life because um, I you know, wasn't earning any money. And, and, and I, I was conscious that, you know, it's easy to get stuck in that and, and you end up being, you know, a, a career of nothing. So <clears throat> I started to look at coaching. I'd, I'd always enjoyed coaching. And, and basically, whilst I was playing, I was very fortunate that I had access to a, a person who was ultimately my mentor as a coach, which was ha Harold Swash. You obviously knew Harold uh, from your days as a member at Hillside. So ha Harold was established as a putting coach. Um, so, you know, even even like through university and, and, and prior to uni, I'd always been around Harold and helped him with certain things. I used to carry for him as a kid. Um, and then when I got into professional golf, I started to work with him a little bit more to earn money. So, you know, I was trying to like, fund my professional golf by working around that and, and some of that involved helping Harold. So it was just when I decided to stop playing, it was na a natural thing for me to get into golf coaching because obviously I love golf, always I wanted to stay within golf. I'd had um, experience of doing a little bit with Harold I'd been doing a bit of coaching to earn some money and uh, was interested in that side of things, you know, the whole sports science sort of thing. I was like always looking at, you know, that element of stuff. So it, I kind of, I started coaching and then I did my PJ at Hillside under Brian Seddon and was doing some like junior coaching there, stuff like that to earn money. But immediately I was like kind of working, you know, in intensely with Harold. So, um, even though I was kind of new to coaching, I was starting to specialise in that area by virtue of being mentored by Harold. And then that was it, really. It kind of snowballed from there. Um, I was about three years into that sort of um, working structure. I was offered an opportunity through a golf manufacturer to um, go out on tour as a representative of that, of that, of that company. And that was a company called Yes Golf, who Harold was, um, he designed clubs for them. And that was a big turning point for me because it, 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 it took me out onto certain tour events. And um, I was there kind of as a, a specialized fitter. And then you start building relationships with certain tour players and a few guys that I knew because I played golf with them. And um, you're kind of in the shot window in, in that respect. And you build relationships with players. Some of those players then come and take lessons from you and stuff like that. And 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 like I said, I'd say looking back, that was a, a turning point because that kind of um, changed a little bit the direction that I was going in and um, gave me access to better players and helped very quickly help build up my experience of working with players at that level. And then it's just kind of continued from there, really, to, to where I am today. So you've worked with some big players. I mean... I'd picked out Colin. Mon I didn't know you worked with Colin Montgomery. Yeah, more in recent years, at uh, towards right. the end of his sort of like. Um, because you know, he strikes me as someone that knows his game, and almost wouldn't want anyone telling him about his game. No one knows more about his game than than Colin Montgomery. So it it was it was a it was a surprise to me when I saw that. But I think there's a lot of players you could put into that category at that level. I mean, yeah. you don't get to compete at that level without knowing your game. Mm. And then if you look at coaching at that level, it's not about telling those players what to do. It's about working with them to work out what they, what they do when they do things well and how they can maintain that and what they, where things could break down for them. 
So it's a very like it's a two way process that you know, you're not there saying, all right, Colin, keep your head down, left arm straight. You know, you're not telling him what to do. Really? <laughs> you're literally. Um, and, and, and the other thing about at that level also, they're, they're just, very often they're just good at what they do. It, they don't necessarily know exactly how they do it. Right. They're just very good at going out and doing it. Yeah. So you, that's where you could help just with like giving them a structure and understanding. So it, it is a lot more of a refined process at that level than it is teaching a beginner, you know, as you can imagine in terms of football, if you apply it to football, it's a lot more of a refined process, the better the player that you're working with. So I've got to ask you about, have you got any Ryder Cup stories for us? Because obviously you've been involved in three, you've been involved in four Ryder Cups, three winning Ryder Cups as a coach on the team. You're wearing the, all the club, or walking around with both. Just before we get into that, I'll give you a bit of time to think about a story which you can actually say on air. But yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, how, how does it work with you with the Ryder Cup? Do you, are you there available to every player or are you just there for no. Tony Fleetwood and Lee Westwood or whatever? You, the Ryder Cup is <clears throat> it's a team event, isn't it? It's probably the closest thing that you get to football, I think. But you, you're the, it's a group of individuals and, and, and you're there because I've often heard like, oh, Ryder Cup coach. I'm not a Ryder Cup coach. I've just been to a Ryder Cup with the players I work with. So you're there to support the players that you, you work with. Now, I think the way the Ryder Cup has evolved in recent years, you're very much treated as a family. So you're kind of there as a collective. And I think that's one of the things Europe has been really good at. So you f- you do feel part of the team. And you'd even have like conversations with players that, or, you know, and, and things are discussed with players that you've never really spoke to that much. But because you're there, you kind of like, you, you, you act like a team. If you're enjoying this video so far, Please show your support for the Ken7 channel by subscribing, clicking the like button, and also clicking the notifications button as well to get future broadcasts. If you could also share the video on your Twitter and Facebook account, that will show YouTube's algorithm that you like our content. Have you heard about Ken7 merchandise? The link is in the description of this video. We have premium fanware for fans, covering Liverpool, Celtic and Scotland and it's fanware for young and old so we have t-shirts, hoodies, sweatshirts, caps, mugs, you name it we've got it. Just something else to remember every purchase that is made on our website we donate to the Marina Dalgalish Appeal so you're helping a great cause as well. So primarily you're, you're there to you know with the player that you work with um, and it's such a busy week that players don't get a lot of time to practice. Um, so you're not really kind of, you don't really get the chance to do much work and you're certainly not kind of changing things. So you're there very much as a, in a supporting role in case things go wrong. Um, but, you know, the great experience is, like, you know, as, as I said, because you, as a sporting fan, you know, you're in that environment, you're inside the ropes, aren't you? So you're seeing things getting said and done in this context that you've watched from outside of the ropes, like as a kid, you know, I remember when my dad took me down to the Belfry in I think 85, like as a kid to go and watch the Ryder cup. And then, you know, we went back in 89. So like, you've got this impression you're watching these players perform in this theater. And then all of a sudden you're in that theater. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an amazing experience to, to be involved in. And, I mean, you, you talked about a couple of like memories or a couple of stories. Well, I remember my first Ryder Cup 2010. I went down there. I was working with Ross Fisher and Eduardo Molinari. And basically, when I look back, I didn't have a clue. Um, but I've gone down there and I'm tagging along and I'm, you know, doing my bits. But you, you really kind of watching. But um, I remember being stood. Um, on the fairway, there was a, I think it was one of the latter foursomes games or four ball games on a Saturday or something like that. And Eduardo was playing with his brother, Fran. And we're on the 18th fairway and I'm stood in the middle of the fairway. And there's like this amphitheatre that goes behind the player. And, and Francesco is about to play his wedge shot into the green. And I'm stood about 50 yards behind him, watching him hit this shot. And he hits it stiff and the whole crowd go up. You know, like you know, big this big noise, 
And my missus had come down for the weekend. I'm stood with her, managed to sort of get a pass for her. I turned around to Linz and I said, this is like being on the pitch at Wembley and watching Gerrard score a penalty from really? directly behind. Yeah, because that's the kind of view, isn't it? You're right yeah. behind the thick of the action. And that was like a spine-tingling moment just yeah, to yeah. kind of appreciate that. And then there was a- another outstanding memory for me was 2016, we went to Hazel team. Darren Clark was a captain. And um, I'd been to the 14, 10 Ryder Cup, 14 Ryder Cup, and they were good. You know, Paul McGinley was a great captain. But the coaching staff, they weren't really kind of overly included. You had this separate area that you would go, which you shared a lot with, with, you know, like family members, stuff like that. And then you could go and do your stuff on the practice ground. Um, but then when you, in between your work, you had your own area. But Clarky was the first one to really embrace the whole team thing. So the coaching staff were very much part of that. So you were in the team room. Um, you were allowed in the locker room. So it was a great week, you know, from, you know, from the Monday, from the Sunday when you arrived there to be in those little environments and see little things and share experiences. But there was one particular, I think it was the Friday, Friday afternoon. Um, we got battered in the morning, but then in the afternoon, the, the, the team had come back. They had a really good, um, they, they won that session, turned things around, got some momentum. And as the players were coming into the locker room, there's a really good vibe, music playing. It's like how you'd expect, you know, the locker room yeah, yeah. or you know, changing room in football. <clears throat> and I stood there and then um, it was like an t- immediate team meeting. So all the players were going in and um, in, into, the, into the team room. So, and everyone sat down and music's going and the atmosphere was amazing. You know, high-fiving each other players, all this lot. And I was sat in the corner and Clarkie comes in and there's this team meeting and you've got like Sergio, Westwood, Poulter, like all these like Ryder Cup. And the energy of the players, you know, Sergio stood up giving it a fist pump and talking and Poulter's. And I'm in this corner of this room and the energy of the players, it was amazing. It was like spine tingling again that you think you're in sharing this kind of Ryder Cup moment. And although they got beat at that time, you sense that something special was going to happen. This team were going to make this comeback. And it just showed you, you got a sense of how much it means to players to actually partake in that event <clears throat> yeah. and how it brings them together. And it, that's something that you kind of imagine from the outside that goes on. But when you get a chance to see it and the dynamic and that, it, it, it literally is like something that someone would pay a lot of money to be in that room and experience. And you're the, and you're lucky to share it. So they, they, they were they're, they're t- like two memories for me just as a sports fan to say, like, you know, I'll take those to my grave. That's something that I never thought I'd get a chance to do or see. And I was lucky enough to do it. And then one final, one final radical memory, which is funny. That's great. That's um, great. As many as you've got. Was, <laughs> there was in that Ryder Cup match, in, the, in that Hazel team match, um, there was a, one particular match where Rafa played with Sergio. And Rafa had really kind of performed amazingly well coming down the stretch and they won this point. And uh, Rafa was pumped and he's coming into the locker room and uh, the music was going, he was high-fiving the people coming in. And then as he turned around into the main part of the locker room, he just stood there and, and said something like, vamos or something like that and just stood there. And as he stood there, as you looked down, his balls were hanging out. Because <laughs> <laughs> he'd obviously sacked up coming down the last few holes, you know, was pumped and just walked into the locker room with his balls hanging out. So <clears throat> that was um, that's another good moment. So, yeah. Um, there's a famous, I don't, were you there for this? Um, I have a feeling it was at Celtic Park. Alex Ferguson gave a, a chat to the players. That was at Glen Eagles, yeah. Was it? Were um, you there? So, um, yeah, I left the room at that point. Right. For any reason? I, 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 <laughs> no, just I just didn't want to be around the bloke. <laughs> oh, it was just... No, uh, uh, <laughs> you you no, were... He, so in, that was 2014, Paul McGinley. And I think it might be a United Fantasy. He, I think he got, I think he got Alex Ferguson to come and give like a team speech because no, normally 
like each year they'll have someone like that or each Ryder Cup they'll have someone come and, and um, do something like that. Um, and I think Ferguson was in 14. In 16, they had a, um, a prominent British Lions rugby player. I forget his name now. I'm not into me rugby, but he, he gave a really sort of inspiring speech. And that year was the first year that coaches were included in, in stuff like that. Yeah. So, so I mean, the Ferguson, Ferguson thing, I, you would never, you know, I, I wouldn't have said that because that's just like a player only type thing. Were but the players talking about it afterwards? Yeah, I, I can't, I can't recall, but invariably they generally, you know, the, the, the people, the, the caliber of people that they have come down and provide these insights and speeches that they do leave an impression. And as much as our whiskey face there, you know, um, has been a thorn in our side over the years, you can't, you can't doubt what a great manager he was. And I'm sure the insights he would have brought would have been amazing. Um, I'd have loved to have been in that room. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. That's why I was asking. I mean, I've yeah. actually read two of his autobiographies. I mean, I've got I hate Man United, but I, I've actually, yeah. read, I find it, he must have something, you know, for what he's achieved in his career. So that's why I was asking, really, whether you'd heard what he'd said. No, I can't recall anything um, specific, but um, I, I do, what I do recall is that it left a good impression. Mm. What, what, someone I wanted to ask you about, um, I mean, I'm, I obviously was massively into golf when we were kids. Yeah, um, I'm less so now. I play very socially whenever, and I don't really watch it on the telly. But one person that has caught my eye, and and there seems to be a lot of interest in him because he's like the mad professor of golf, is Bryson DeChambeau. And yeah. I had actually <clears throat> gone and I was I was playing golf with my father-in-law, and he was going on about him and how he, he's got all his clubs of the same length and all the, the way he's remodeled the swing and stuff. But you know. Give us give us a bit of, of insight into what you know about about him, and you know he's 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 a sensation at the moment, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he is. I mean, obviously, he's one of the best players in the world now. Um, um, yeah, I, I think like he's pushing the boundaries a lot in various things, various areas. Um, I think when when he he had a great collegiate record, you know, he, he's not, you know, when he came into professional golf. He probably had one of the best collegiate records, you know, historically. So he was obviously a very high level of talent. Um, but he, he, he already was doing things very different. So you mentioned the single length uh, concept, yeah. which is a concept that's been about for a number of years where every iron should be the same length and then you create some consistency in, in setup and certain other elements. But no one, you know, no one had really embraced it. Um, but he'd embraced it. There was, he's. I think he's got like a physics major, so he he he, he thinks like a coach basically. Mm. So he's very much like pushing, uh, pushing his coaching team in certain areas to say, well, where can we get better? Looking at it from a scientific point of view. Um, so, like one of the things that he's done of late is to completely change his uh, body shape. And, and go on this journey for extra distance. Because um, distance has, has a big impact on, on, on score, basically. Now, I mean, the, the golf, the, the game is very much developed in terms of a power game. And further you hit it, you, can, you, can, you have the potential to significantly reduce your score, which mm. may sound you know, very simple looking from outside of golf, but it's not always been that case. So he's gone about a journey to hit it as far as he can. Now, over the, in recent years, like long driving's become a, a fashionable, and you've got these like these long drivers and long driving competition, but it's not always corresponded with accuracy and the other match the other elements of the game. But what he's doing is kind of almost bringing them both together now. So um, he's got the skills of a long driver, but also the skills of within the other areas of the game, like finesse skills and stuff like that, course management. But he's looking at it from a very marginal gains perspective, like what are the different areas I can improve by X percent? How do I go about Mm. it? Um, So, yeah, scientifically driven, data driven, and and pushing the boundaries and looking at things that maybe, you know, golfers and coaches even haven't looked at 
you know, historically, he's looking at to try and try and get better. Um, some people like it. Some people don't. You know, some right. people don't. They think that, that he's changing the game and go, and, go, and taking it in, into a direction. Well, I don't think he's changing the game, but he's exposing part of the game or exposing where the game's going and uh, taking it in a direction where that, that they don't like, where right. it becomes too much about distance right. um, stuff like that. Um, We've had long but, yeah, no, before, though, haven't we? I mean, Tiger hits it a mile, Rory hits it a mile. <clears throat> There's been other pros, I'm sure, but I mean, is he is he significantly lo- hitting it longer than than that? Yeah, is yeah. He? So, yeah, I mean, like your you top top ball hitters, like historically, like you know, go back five years ago. And I'm not an expert in this area, putting my, more my thing. But you might have like out on tour, like mid seventies, high high one seventy ball speed could be like you know where they're at. Well, in practice, like he's getting over. You know, could be up to two ten ball speed now, which which is significant. And they'll do like these training sessions where it's all about training ball speed, like the long drivers do, where it's just trying to hit it as hard as you can to get your maximum speed. And they're not on a golf course; he's not hitting every shot at that speed. But there'll be an instance where, like at Bay Hill on Sunday, there's a particular par five that's a dog leg around water. So the further you can carry it, the 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 more the closer to the green you can aim it. And he made this carry, which is like a 370 carry, and then was in like a greenside bunker on a par five. I so did actually that, see that footage. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then Westwood, who's not sure, he's got to go on a different line, and he's left himself 250 in or something, or 200 and something in. He's in like wow. a, a sit, you know. So it it's very different dynamic to the game. Um, and uh, to bring it back to putting, though, what, although he. Although he's changed, you know, the long driving aspect and, 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 you know, stuff like that, he's also doing something very, very different with his putting. You know, he, he tried to put side saddle, which was everyone stands to the side of the, of the ball traditionally. Well, he put it, he kind of stood behind using like a croquet style for a period of time to see if he could put back like that. And then he's got that a particular legal. style. That, well, as long as you're not stood on your line, if you're slightly to the side of it, but he was, do, he was basically doing croquet style putting. So he's 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 doing this. Is that what he was doing? So he's he did he, in that yeah. way, and he's doing that. Yeah, yeah, wow. he did it. And then he switched to like an arm lock um, style. But he, he, even in his arm lock style, he, he does something very different to traditional arm lock. Um, and when he t- talks about it, you know, there's a science behind it. So he'll internally wrote his, his internally rotate his upper lead arm, and then and then basically supinate his lower arm. So the basically it's like they're both at an end range to lock out the the arm and right. then it can't rotate. Right. So he creates this particular style, and it, he's just thinking about it slightly differently than what most people have thought about it. And and he's basically sort of um, shaping his own pathway. Not he's not following anyone else's. He's going on his own. Incredible. I mean, it's, so, yeah. It, the golf is always dominated by a few main players, isn't it? Um, and he obviously fancies getting himself up up there, and 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 in a way that makes sense to to him. I mean, obviously you've got a, a, a master's degree, so do you, do you have are you do you have massive respect for him, admiration? I, I, I yeah, I've got a, a a lot of respect for what he's doing and how how he's going about it, and, and you know, one the courage to do it. But also, you know, you respect like his um, the level of detail and, and what he's how he's trying to break things down. Absolutely, because it's he's having success with it as well. So you've got to respect it, haven't you? I mean, I think it's 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 for him, you know, and it might that approach would not work for other people. Mm. Um, and I think you can say that for, for uh, look at any golfer that's successful, like Tiger's approach or how he did it. You know that's not going to work for a another player, and, and and Bryson is very different in his approach. Well, Faldo, and, he, Faldo certain... back in the day, remodeled his swing yeah. right at the top, didn't he? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and you could say that, um, you know, Bryson's done something equal, if not or or, or not bigger than. Mm-hmm. Um, but how many people did Faldo ruin? You no, know, 
a prominent caddy who's been around the game for a long, long time said that Fal- you know, he believed that Faldo ruined a generation of English golfers because they tried to do what he did in terms of the rebuild uh, swing and stuff like that. And the, if you look back in the record books, there's a period of time where English golf was not very successful um, because some of those philosophies get filtered down and people apply them when it's not the right thing for them to well, do. We, but we both went was, to one of all those coaches <clears> back in the day. What was his name, Dennis? Is Dennis the- Sheehy was a Ledbetter coach, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, so the whole Ledbetter thing, mm. which is Faldo's coach, that kind of spawned mm. a, a group of coaches and stuff. Um, but then, you know, that, like I said, that's not right for everyone. You know, when I look back, that wasn't right for me at the time. Um, and, you know, but I think you can always learn from what these people are doing, can't you? So you can look at what, how do you learn from Bryson? Well, you might not copy what he's doing. But what I think the things you can learn from are he's he's looking at marginal ga- marginal gains in each of those areas. He's looking to get longer, and the m- more length you can get at the moment, that definitely helps you. So, as a golfer, are you looking to increase your length? You know, through your training in the gym, through your equipment, through how you train physically. He's you know his course management, how he does things on the course, like. Every distance he has, he has like a, a certain number. So he'll use like clock face positions for how he controls his wedges. You know, he, his puts on the golf course, he'll 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 walk out distance wise, and he'll know an exact swing length for each put, right. which is obviously OTT. But basically, each element he's looking at: what do I need to do to get better at that? You know, what are the marginal gains here, 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 and here. And I think that's where he's having his success is his approach, not necessarily the things that he might be doing, but I think his analytical approach. And if you look at like, you can take other examples in sport of late where you look at British cycling and, and um, you know, the, the director of performance for British cycling when, the, uh, when he was involved in the Olympics, is it, I forget the guy's name now. Um, but he, he then, when he left British cycling, he went into Team Sky um, but when you look at a lot of the things that British cycling did, it was again marginal gains. You know, like one percent here. You know, they would have particular pillows that the riders would, um, you know, take. You know, particular beds. They'd feng shui the hotel rooms for the riders, so when they got there, they had the perfect, right. you know, room for rest and stuff like that. They had um, those riders carried um, hand sanitizer, hand sanitizers all the time to keep the hands clean so they never picked up a bug. Right. So if they were ill, you know, there's loads of things like every stone was left unturned. That feeds and, into the mentality as well, doesn't it? You feel like everything's being done for you. There's no excuse for you not to be able to perform at your best. <clears throat> yeah, I think so. It can be a burden for other people right. at the same time. You know, it can be a burden for other people, definitely. Um, but I think when you get into that sort of mindset and then you're having success with it, then I think it can, it can create a, a momentum and, you know, it, it becomes like self-fulfilling then because you're creating this sort of edge that you feel that you have and you've got the success and you can almost like elevate yourself above mm. perceived elevation, perceived elevation above everyone else in the field. And that's like what Tiger had. And I'm sure, you know, if Bryson continues to have his success, that's what he's that's what he's going to end up like and that's what elite sport people do don't they they ultimately have you know more confidence than everyone else and they probably look at everyone else and think well yeah i'm going to beat you today and you know that i'm going to beat you today and it's, that's, that's it's, it's the same with football. Big part of it. i'm sure last season liverpool were one nil up before they went on the pitch yeah, or when it was nil nil with ten minutes to go, you like <sighs> they were they were the team that knew that we were going to win, and the other team knew that Liverpool yes. knew that they were going to win. It's, it, and it's the United thing, isn't it? You know, like how many times, you know, when United were at their best, would they Ferg, Fergie time? Mm, yeah, that's that's mentality, isn't it, of What's the that? highest level, and that's a lot of that. I think is psychological momentum. But where does psychological momentum come from? Mm. Well, it comes from those one percent marginal gains every day and building on them, mm. building on them. But when that cracks, where do you go back to? Well, we talked about before. You go back to your fundamentals, basics. the foundations of what you do, the basics, and then you build upon that every day, don't you? And stuff, and 
hopefully you get that momentum come back you put some results together on that that you know kickstart you know gives it a kick to a higher level and you've got that obviously upward spiral hopefully over time and not the down downward spiral that we're on at the moment <laughs> listen listen lovely stuff thanks mate for uh, for chatting to me uh, yeah pleasure mate good to catch good up to, talk to you and um yeah Thanks for doing this. Listen, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to the video and click the like button. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll see you again for, uh, for some other exciting interviews we've got lined up. Thanks very much. Cheers, mate.